Good morning. Welcome to worship at Lindsay United Methodist Church. If you are streaming live, listening on the radio live, if you're streaming later, we thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here in person this morning. Lovely spring day. You can wear your shorts today because it's going to be hot and windy. So don't light any matches anywhere. Just be careful of that. Uh, a few announcements here. Uh, the food and monetary donations for the food pantry are coming in, and they are so very greatly appreciated. Thank you for that. Appreciate your support uh, of that ministry that we do there. Uh, please join us on Wednesday, e Wednesday evenings. Choir practice, snack supper, Bible study, all kinds of stuff. So come and join the fellowship. Child care is provided. And I am going to uh, recognize Shelby Sanders. Hey, there's Shelby. Um, if you would come up and tell us about all the great accomplishments that the kids in the community did, we want to support all of the youth and uh, their successes. And so you have a few to announce, I understand. We had several students go to district solo and ensemble yesterday at Norman High School. And overall, we had uh, two excellent ratings with our clarinet choir and Dalton Parker on his French horn solo. A good rating with Alexis Gregg and Kylie Largent with their trombone duet. And we had seven superior ratings, and out of those seven, we have six qualifying for state that will get to go to OSU at the end of April. So Dylan Rains on her flute solo, Sydney Brooks and Gabe McDonald on their trumpet duet, Aurora Winningham with a flute solo, Alondra Lopez with the alto saxophone solo, Aaliyah Scruggs with her clarinet solo, and Matthew Dutton with a saxophone solo. So we're very blessed, and uh, the band program is thriving. So thank you for all that support that, and Miss Heron accompanying us uh, with those solos. So thank you all so much. All right, I think uh, the pastor has some announcements to make. I'll turn it over to him. <coughs> well, first I want to announce, uh, is to simply say, what a blessing the both of you bring to this church and to this community with your skills and your talents. You're touching lives at a very important time, and you're bringing able to teach them both music as well as express your own faith and through that. So I just think we ought to, again, compliment and lift both of them up for their great musical skills and work with young people in our in our community and in our church. Thank you again. It occurred to me uh, this week as I'm uh, preparing things that well, there's a new movie coming out called Cabrini. It is about Mother Cabrini, the lady who became known as Mother Saint Cabrini, the first American to be canonized as a saint. And uh, it, it, my idea is probably a little too late but it at least it inspired the idea that we need to be talking about it, whether or not things of this nature would in, uh, be interest to go as a group or uh, uh, from time to time. And uh, we've got a couple of vans and we've got, uh, we can do some group purchasing. But if there's an interest in Cabrini uh, to go see, that's in a couple of weeks. I think the 8th is when it opens. Um, and there are some discounted tickets. And if there's some interest in that, please get with, get with me or Deb right after the worship uh, today. And let me know that you have some interest in, in maybe going as a group uh, to, to check out the movie. You can go online now and catch uh, the uh, trailers for, for it. It looks excellent, and the people who are presenting it are, are look excellent. What is not in the calendar uh, of the bulletin is that our, uh, some of our uh, work teams are getting started, and I wanted to share the care team will be meeting you should, all of you should have gotten an uh, uh, email, but we'll meet this Monday, um, tomorrow, at 6 p.m. The worship team will be meeting Thursday at 5 p.m. The hospitality team will be meeting, and both the hospitality and worship team will be meeting here in the sanctuary, will be meeting at 7 p.m. And then our technology team will be on March 12th, uh, and that will be Tuesday the 12th, and it will be at 5 p.m. 
And if you want to get involved in these or in other action uh, committees, action teams, please see me. Uh, a lot of the selections came from either uh, my work with you or from those who had filled out uh, those uh, interview forms um, that expressed your interest. And we have those at the church office. We want to get everybody involved. There's so much for us to do uh, as we reinvigorate this church and move into the future. And if you want to find a way to involve and use your skills and talents, please just let us know. We'll find a place. Because one of those things is going to be new members and how we address our new members and how we bring them all the way into full membership uh, here with our church. And that will be one of the next action teams uh, to get organized. So anyway, worship and caring, caring and praying and uh, commercial uh, communication, communications, technology, um, and caring for others. These are all the teams that are getting going uh, this started this week. And I think that covers why not? All right, so during this Lenten season, let's be in prayer for the church, for all of these things that we want to do and get involved in. Uh, we are here in this opportunity to worship in this nice place. Um, the joy and, if you want to say, the duty to worship the Lord. We thank you for being here. Uh, so let us prepare our hearts for worship this morning. The Lord be with you. Let's stand together and sing our opening hymn. Great is the Lord. It's number 2022. Great is the Lord. He is holy and just. By his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, he is faithful and true, by his mercy he proves he is love. Great is the Lord, and worthy of glory, great is the Lord, and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord, now lift up your voice, now lift up your voice. the Lord. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. He is holy and just. By his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord. He is faithful and true. By his mercy he proves he is love. Great is the Lord and worthy of glory. Great is the Lord and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord. Now lift up your voice. Now lift up your voice. Great is the Lord. of glory. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of praise. Great are you, Lord, I lift up my voice, I lift up my voice. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, And while you remain standing, let's sing praise to the Lord the Almighty. It's number 139 in the hymn. <coughs> Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O oh, my soul, praise him, for he is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear, now to his temple draw near. Join me in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord, who o'er all things so wondrous. 
Joyously reigning Bears thee on eagle's wings Ere in his keeping maintaining God's care enfolds All whose true good he upholds Hast thou not known his sustaining Praise to the Lord who doth prosper thy work and defend thee. Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do, who with his love doth Praise to the Lord who doth nourish thy life and restore thee, fitting thee well for the tasks that are ever before thee. Then to thy need, God as a mother doth speed, spreading the wings of grace Praise to the Lord, O oh, let all that is in me. <coughs> all that hath life and breath come now with praises before him. Let the Amen sound from his people again, gladly forever. Please join me in the call to worship. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The firmament proclaims God's handiwork. We celebrate, we celebrate the steadfast, steadfast love, love of God, of God our, creator. our Creator. Surely God, God is faithful, faithful to all who live in covenant. covenant. From the sun's rising to its setting, the creation speaks. Day and night, earth's creatures announce God's call. The commandments of God are clear, enlightening the eyes. God's, God's law is perfect, calling forth our best. God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The ordinances of God are true and righteous. In following them, we gain wisdom and strength. And will you join together with me in a sharing of the invocational prayer as printed in the bulletin and also on the screen. All wise and all loving God, we are drawn together in this place because our knowledge and discernment is not enough to give meaning to our lives. All the pieces of our busy days need a center, and we have come because we recognize the foolishness of trying to center ourselves upon the ways of the world or a pop culture which only takes us further from you. We seek to more fully understand how focusing on the cross, we more truthfully understand the power of God's love and discover the distance God seeks to travel to reclaim us. We admit that we, when honest with ourselves, we are frightened about what you may ask of us. Let our ears be filled with your word, and may our tongues sing praises, and our minds offer meditations that are acceptable to you. Amen. If you are able, please turn. To, please remain standing and turn to page 881 of our uh, hymnal, also on the screen. We'll share together in the Apostles' Creed, an ancient text in the Christian Church, one that connects us with all Christians of all denominations around the world. Let's share it together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We'll continue with prayer. Gracious God, we give thanks for this day of sunshine. We give thanks for the seasons that come through our lives, times of cold and times of warm, times of change. We seek your wisdom and guidance as we look out into the world and see the struggles and the strife all filled with people and under leadership that's not connected to you. Lord God, we ask for your wisdom and guidance in our own lives and in our ability to speak towards others, to share your wisdom, to share your understanding of peace, your understanding of joy, of hope, of love and salvation. When we get struggle, filled with struggles and are unable to know where to turn, Lord, remind us to share that prayer that your Son taught us as we say it now together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now will our our, uh, ushers please come forward to gather our tithes and offerings.
You may be seated. He keeps sneaking up on me with an operatory prayer there. Sorry. Uh, I don't see any children out there, so we're going to move on from that uh, and read our New Testament text. Now, I'm confused, and I'm going to ask Alan for advice. My understanding is you only stand for gospel reading. Right. You don't have to stand for Old Testament or the epistles, is that? You, you can go either. Either way. Right. Okay. You can remain seated if you like. Uh, our scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believed. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. And may God bless your lives as you hear and you understand the reading of his holy word. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now we're going to sing another song. This may not be real familiar. Lex is going to play through uh, the first part of it. So you can kind of get that in your head. It's called Alleluia. It's, in, it's number 162 in the hymnal. Alleluia, alleluia, give thanks to the risen Lord. 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 Alleluia, alle
Our gospel text this morning comes from the book of John. I'll be reading from chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. Now, John, if you uh, read his text, you realize that it is not in the same chronological sequence that the other three gospels have. John is intent on bringing a, a message to make it clear that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and is sent to you and to me to bring a message. And so he is very pointed in his message um, and the way he wrote his gospel, so not in the chronological sense. So in this text, we find uh, John in a bit of a hurry to get Jesus to the temple. And, And here, beginning with 13, the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jews went up to Jerusalem. And in the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and dove, and money changers seated at their tables, they making a whip of cords and drove uh, all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out all the coins of money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling uh, the doves to take these things out of here and to stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples reminded him that it was written that zeal of your house will will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us? It allows you to do these things. Jesus answered them, destroy the temple, and in three days I will raise it up. So Jews said to them, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and yet you claim to raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body after he was raised for three days. Uh, from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had uh, said these things, and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Success. And whatever we do, whatever venture we take, success should be uh, our goal, isn't it? And we should always strive to do the best that we can. And yet it never seemed to fail me in business and even in my own uh, uh, self-work and efforts how easily it is for us, for all of us, to let things slide on the side. And sometimes we'll pick it up and fix it. Later, there's always seems to be not enough time to do it right the first time. But we can fix it in a few additional uh, efforts. Henry Ford uh, was great for his development skills and and, uh, his development. Now, he was not the creator of, of the first cars or automobiles, but he had helped to revolutionize the auto industry. His first vehicle... Um, was known as the quadricycle. And it rolled on four wheels. It weighed about 500 pounds. looked more like a bicycle. It achieved the speed of 20 miles an hour. That was exceptional when you consider that most horseless carriages uh, averaged about five miles an hour. In 19, or 1896, um, it was pretty impressive to come out with that speed. But what's seldom not told about this story is that while he was working in his shed building this thing, he never stopped to consider the size of the door would be required to get the quadricycle out. 
And when he had it finished, when he was ready to roll it out onto the street, he suddenly realized the door was too small. Now, that didn't stop him. He grabbed a saw and he grabbed an axe and he literally chopped and cut the opening wider so he could get his quadricycle out. In that early morning, about 1.30, it hit the streets and began to set some records and changes. He was obsessed over perfection. He didn't believe in cutting corners just to make a profit. It's better to do some things right than it is to do it any other way. But I wonder, maybe poorly is doing better than nothing at all. It's a question for you to contemplate, even as we think about our church. Is poor acceptable versus nothing? Is not at all better than, than uh, doing uh, nothing else. And so as you contemplate this morning, ask yourself this. If you're placed in a position of learning, are you allowed in a church? Are you allowed in God's presence to error and to then learn and to grow? Or is perfection the only thing acceptable? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as you obediently take and lead us forward to Jerusalem and towards the cross, give us what we need to walk with you on this journey. Though we cower as the cross looms before us, strengthen us so that we might faithfully follow your ways to which you have called us to do. And Lord God, I ask that you give meaning and purpose to the words that I share this morning. I pray that they are received as you desire, and they set the hearts of your people on fire. Amen. Long ago, there was an ancient bell that was famous for its incredible tone. It had been commissioned by a king and the king sought to honor the gods of that day and to honor his people. And with his advisors, they sought out to make this gigantic bell that could be heard for miles away. They thought it would not only bring peace and contentment, but it would glorify the gods of their time, and it would also serve to give warning to those who could hear. They located and searched everywhere until they could find the idyllic bell maker. And they found a man and his crew who agreed to take this on. And they tried one pour after another after another, and they could not achieve the sound quality that they wanted. And so... It was decided that a sacrifice needed was needed. And in their barbaric time and place, they went through the land and found a mother with a sole child and decided that child was perfect for their sacrifice. And the child, when the bell was ready to be poured, all the molten was ready, the child was thrown in to the molten, and they had the sound of a bell that was incredible. Yet, the words, the sounds of that child's voice as she's been carried away calling for her mother, Amelia, could be heard. Now, for most of the people that did not know all of the story, did not know the child, did not know the mother, there was great joy to be heard in this bell. But every time the bell rang, the mother of that child felt incredible pain and loss. And all the neighbors and friends that knew that mother and that child had the same sense of loss more than 
the sense of the beauty. You see, pain and suffering is part of our life. It's part of human existence. We get pain and suffering from all kinds of things, things that are done to us and things that we've done to others and things that sometimes were by intent and not, but we suffer and we hurt. The power in this case is the realization that as we Christians move and walk towards the cross, as we get closer and closer to Easter, we need to begin to recognize that sense of suffering and sacrifice that is being made so that we can benefit, not from the sacrifice of a child. But it is in that pain and suffering, as we look at ourselves looking at that cross, that we begin to recognize the gift that was given so that we could have salvation. Perhaps that's maybe why John began early in his text to talk about Jesus going to the temple. For the history and the, uh, over much of the Israeli people, this history of sacrificing in order to get salvation was an understood practice in those times. To get or to receive forgiveness, one must do something or give up something because they had already sinned. They had made the sins. They had made the mistakes. They had made the errors. And now they needed to sacrifice. They needed to give up something of value in order to receive that forgiveness. And in that time, the idea of, of sins having different levels and, and the church having a system of uh, one sin equals one cow and another sin equals a, equals a dove and, and so forth was just uh, absurd to us to consider, but it was part of the system that existed. And so you would give your money you would give your cow, you would give what you had in order to be sacrificed as part of your forgiveness. Now, to be clear, you couldn't just sell the cow and take no money. The cow had to be sacrificed. There had to be no benefit. And let's also be clear. God gets nothing off this practice of sacrifice. He gains nothing. He needs nothing. The whole idea of sacrifice was not about what God needed, what, but rather about what we needed to deal with in terms of our efforts to change. The problem with sacrifices, I could give you a dove, give God a dove this week and God a dove another week, and, and maybe it's not that costly. Maybe it doesn't make a change, but I'm not changing. The sacrifice that's being given requires you and I to make a change. When Jesus enters this temple and sees the racket going on over the idea of coming to God and seeking forgiveness, he loses himself. He creates all kinds of chaos and turmoil, throwing over tables, chasing out cattle and, and sheep and other things out of the temple. A temple, a place to come to engage with, with God. And on all this other going on inside of its walls, inside of its temple. And let's not confuse what was going on there with, with scouts coming to sell spaghetti or youth doing a pancake meal or, or uh, men's or women's groups uh, raising some funds to carry on their ministry. This wasn't about that. This was indeed a system of selling or trading in order to create a reasonable sacrifice, in order to gain forgiveness from God. I will exchange and give up my dove or give up my cow so that my sins will be forgiven. Jesus came to change that. Now, interestingly, in the story, I'll just point out that one of the interesting elements is, is when the temple guards and the temple leaders came to Jesus to ask him 
under what authority he had to do all of this. They weren't asking his personal government-issued credentials, no driver's license, no passport. They wanted to know his prophetic license. What was it that enabled him to prophesy and to make these statements in a temple? Where was the spirit and where is the action of God within him? Who was he to be able to do this? And his response, his response was, well, let's just tear down this temple and we will see what happens. I'll build it back in three days. Now, we can't blame the people for, at that time for taking him literally. They see the building and the temple and all these huge stones. They see all of that that is there. It's impossible to imagine it being torn down after they'd done all this work to build it. Herod the Great had spent much effort to bring this temple back from uh, when it had been destroyed. And so, so many years, so much effort to bring it back. How could he possibly do it in three days? And what John wants us to get, and that sometimes is subtle and hard to read if we get too literal, is John wants us to understand he was talking about his body, not buildings. He's talking about if he's destroyed, if God's temple is destroyed, he will come back in three days. He was prophesying of what is to come, his return, his overcoming the evils, his helping us to understand resurrection and forgiveness in a new way. Paul takes this uh, in a new light. He takes that text and he just cuts right to the quick. And he says, I've come to make all those of you who think you're wise and intelligent Question yourself and maybe even seem foolish. You're not going to simply get this if you just go to the intellectual, literal way of understanding what God's wanting to do. It's not just in the simplistic words, but it's in a greater picture, a greater action, an overall theme. God created us out of love. God seeks to be with us out of his love for us. He didn't have to be. He could have created us and gone elsewhere and done other creations. He created us and chose to be with us. And remarkable, incredible God, wonderful God. This isn't some God who doesn't care about us. This is a God who wants to have a relationship with each of us. He wants us to have a way back. He understands we've got to have boundaries. We have to have rules. We have to have ways that help us live a righteous life and know what those are. Those Ten Commandments are a wonderful, incredible starting place and could be all that is needed. Moses himself said, the Ten Commandments is all that we need. We don't need more. What God gave us is sufficient. Yet we like to compromise. We like to take our minds and our thoughts and think that maybe we, we can figure this out better. We can come up with a better equation. We can find better sets of rules. Maybe we can get better equality in the things that we do. I'm reminded, as I was preparing for this uh, sermon this morning, I was reminded just a few Sundays ago, we, we were at Transfiguration Sunday, where we celebrated Jesus and three disciples, Peter and James and John, having gone up to the top of a mountain, Mount Tabor. And there they experienced the tr Jesus' transformation. And they watched Jesus interact with Moses and Ezekiel as they were there in the in the heavens and the skies, brilliant light up, almost transparent, different than what earthly things are like. And they observed this great moment. James and John, the text doesn't tell us that they did anything other than sit there and observe. Peter tried to interact and asked, do I need to build a tent, a temple, a place? to celebrate? Do I need to build a place for all of you to rest? What, what can I do? He wanted to be part 
of what was happening. Oh, the disciples had no idea how small the garage was for what Jesus was building. This was building into his ministry that will lead us to Jerusalem. They come down that mountain and Jesus begins to tell his disciples about what is to come. That in the near future, he will be arrested, falsely accused, tried, convicted, crucified, buried, and then will rise from the dead. On the third day, will rise from all of that and be present with them. And they weren't ready to hear it, especially Peter. Peter was so focused on what he knew and understood that he couldn't get into the mode of being what Jesus was talking about. He couldn't hear beyond what he, his human sense allowed. And he said to Jesus, you're the Messiah, you're the Son of God. Well, there's nobody who's going to harm you and touch you. You're in control of all of this. Seriously, we, we, what are you saying, Jesus? This is what Peter's interacting. And Jesus, I think, responds with some of the harshest words in the whole Bible, uh, certainly in the New Testament. And he says to Peter, to his face, in public, for others to hear, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me. Don't confront me. He's making a reference to when Satan... And Jesus had their encounter in those beginnings of the ministry in the wilderness. When, when Satan says, come, Jesus, feed the world. Take these stones, turn them into loaves of bread. You can do it. Feed the world. He was tempting Jesus. Come on, jump off this temple. You know that all the angels will save you. You won't even uh, bump a finger. Oh, come on, Jesus. Come on, all you got to do is worship me for a, for a year. Oh, okay, a month, a week, even one moment. Come on, Jesus, just worship me one moment, and I'll give you everything the earth has to offer. These are the temptations Jesus fought with. And here Peter is confronting him with similar statements. Peter is saying, you have all the power. You have everything before you. You don't have to worry about, about being falsely accused, and you don't have to worry about being crucified. Come on, none of that's real. No, Jesus says, bluntly and directly and harshly, get behind me, Satan. Jesus is on a mission. You and I are on this mission. No matter what Peter or any of the disciples or you and I will say, Jesus is headed for this cross. And nothing is going to stop him. Because you and I need to understand the depth of God's love. It isn't about a sacrifice. It is about a gift. It is about a gift that helps you and I acknowledge and recognize the sinfulness that is born within us. The sinfulness and the mistakes that we so easily made. Peter wasn't trying to be sinful. Peter was in his human state, and yet he misunderstood what Jesus had been saying. Peter, Peter the one that, that Jesus is going to found the church on, errors in human ways. He's strugg it's a struggle to learn. It's not easy to comprehend. If it was easy, we wouldn't have churches. We wouldn't be in worship if it was easy. It's not. Learning about Christ, following in his ways, understanding our mistakes. There isn't perfection that you and I can have until Jesus puts that perfection around us in heaven. We need that struggle, and Jesus has invited us to be part of it. He tells us it is not easy, and it will be difficult because you and I have to face our own sins. You and I have to reach that own cross in our own hearts. That's the beauty and the power of the resurrection. We begin to get changed in our life. Jesus begins to affect who we are. 
Every time we come and we seek perfection, every time we come to the altar and receive communion, we move closer to Christ. We begin to shed off the sins and the dirt and the things that hold us back. And we draw draw a step closer to God. We begin to change our life. We begin to make that difference without a sacrifice of something else bought or changed. We change in our hearts. And there maybe is the greatest point because that's when we discover that we too, like Henry Ford, had the capacity to open that heart, to open our souls, to allow not just something inside us to go out, but to allow Christ to bring into us all that he has, all the love, all the joy, all of the forgiveness that we need in our life. As you go forward today, as you contemplate the message today, I truly want you to be joyful for this Christ comes to give us newness, comes to give us forgiveness, and brings us this new life today and each day that we are in relationship with him. This is the word of God. Thank you. Amen. Let's go ahead and prepare to respond to the word today by sharing in Holy Communion. Please turn to page 12 in your hymnal. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we are yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. And so in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ. You are forgiven. Amen. Please turn to page 13, and we will continue with a great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, who by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and spirit. On that night when Jesus and his disciples had gathered together, Jesus takes a loaf of bread. He gives thanks to God. He blesses the bread and he breaks the bread. And he passes the bread to his disciples and said, Take, 
eat of this, all of you, for this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. As the meal drew towards conclusion, Jesus takes for us a cup of, uh, of wine, for us juice. And again, he gives thanks to God, and he passes his cup to his disciples and said, Take, drink from this, each of you, for this is my blood poured out for you and for all as a new covenant. As often as you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving in a uh, a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. In this, the United Methodist Church, we believe that this is Christ's table. Christ has set the elements and Christ extends the invitation. As you come forward this morning, I'll ask our communion stewards to serve you at the rail. Come forward and and stand or kneel at the rail and they will serve you uh, with the cup and the bread. Put your hands in the form of the bread and and they'll place that, uh, in the form of a cross, they'll place that bread. Remind you that this is Christ's body broken for you. And they'll offer you the cup and remind you that Christ is Christ's blood poured out for you. The table is set. The invitation is made. Please come forward.
I did have a couple extra announcements that I forgot this morning, earlier. So put on your calendar. Uh, uh, Palm Sunday, of course, is uh, the 20... What did you do with that sheet of paper? Palm Sunday is the 24th. We will have, uh, of course, special services and music here on the 24th. On Thursday, uh, uh, Holy Thursday, we are going to have a special meal and fellowship and gathering worship uh, here in the room. It won't be like last year, but we're going to kind of remember the Passover in, uh, in remembrance of Holy Thursday. Uh, Six o'clock will be the meal. We'll get more information out. Put it down on your calendar. Good Friday. Services will be here at 6 p.m. Again, special music and a very special service is planned. And, of course, Easter on March 31st. And I hope that you invite everyone you can think of to all these different services in our community, whether they belong to this church or not. Invite them. Make them come and be part of, of these services, especially if they don't have any other church home to go to. We want this to be the church home their church home going forward. And with that, let us turn and sing our closing hymn. Let's stand together and sing God of Grace and God of Glory, number 577. <laughs> Church's story, bring her bud to glorious flower. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. For the facing of this hour. Lo, the hosts of evil round us scorn thy Christ, assail his way. Fears and doubts too long have bound us. Free our hearts for work and praise. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of these days. For the facing of these days. Cure thy children's worry, madness, bend our pride to thy control. Shame our wants and selfish gladness, rich in things and poor in soul. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, lest we miss thy kingdom's goal. Lest we miss thy kingdom's goal. Save us from weak resignation to the evils we let the search for thy salvation be our glory evermore. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, serving thee whom we adore, serving thee whom we adore. God sends us forward, walking with Christ towards that cross. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen.